So we'll make a start on alternative investments. This is a small list of all of the topics within the CFA curriculum. So it makes about 3% of the total exam. So that works out to be about 8 questions, which means 4 in the morning and 4 in the afternoon. The questions you'll be getting here usually work out to be quite or fairly straightforward. Um, could be slightly easy if you know exactly what's been going on. But you would need to do the work for it. You need to go through all of the material to see, uh, to, to understand what the uh, underlying information is, uh, to get the basics of all of the different types of investments. Uh, you have some calculations. They are quite easy to work out, but could also very easily go wrong. So you need to know exactly uh, what it is that you need to be doing. Uh, so we'll make a start then. So we've only got one study session here, which breaks up into two readings. First one, reading 66, uh, alternative investments. We're looking at the eight types of alternatives that are mentioned in the curriculum. And then with 67, we'll look at commodities in a bit more detail. So we'll make a start on reading 66 then. I will start off looking at our mutual funds. So these are essentially funds uh, where you have many investors who essentially uh, pull their money together into that fund. And you have a manager that's uh, running the fund. So your mutual funds could be split up into open-end funds or closed-end funds. An open-end fund, uh, all trades are done with the manager. So there's no secondary market. The manager creates the units uh, when, they, when he gets the cash uh, from the investors. And if the investor wants to get out of the investments, uh, they have to sell the shares back to the manager. And the, these transactions can only be done at the end of the day as well. They're called open-end funds because there's no limit to how big uh, these funds can go. So the more people who pile in cash into this fund, the more shares are issued, give back to these investors. So another thing to note as well, as I mentioned before, liquidity is provided by the fund manager. Another thing to note as well, you might have a load, uh, which is essentially fees that you pay at the beginning or at the end of the investment. We'll look at how to do uh, the numbers in a little bit more detail. Uh, because you can essentially redeem your shares at the end of the day uh, using the closing value of, of the underlying uh, investments, that the price for uh, these shares uh, usually uh, roughly work out to be the NAV, the net asset value. With your closed-end fund, and so difference between this and your open-end funds is they have a limited number of shares. So once shares are initially created, this number stays fixed. And trading only takes place on the secondary market. So price of these shares, rather than trading closely uh, w with the NAV, the price of the shares are essentially determined uh, by supply and demand. Because the manager in this case isn't able to create new shares on demand. The shares are typically issued at a small premium, and this serves as some form of compensation to the manager for any sort of issuance costs that they bear. But eventually, uh, the shares for these funds typically trade at a discount uh, because uh, investors may not like the investment mix within the, within the fund itself. For both your open-end funds and closed-end funds, you have your, your ongoing annual fees, uh, which investors have. So moving on to the net uh, asset value of a fund, we already mentioned that previously. Uh, this forms the basis for valuing the shares of an investment company. Your net asset value per share is the value of an investment company's assets minus any liabilities if they have any. As I mentioned before, it's stated on a per share basis. So we said before with an open-end fund, the shares will trade close to the NAV. And the manager essentially determines what this is because they're the ones that decide what assets and liabilities the fund should have. With your closed-end fund, the share price could vary from the NAV because share price is determined due to supply and demand factors or interaction on the secondary markets. So if the share price is greater than the NAV, we say the shares are trading at a premium. And if the share price is less than the NAV, uh, then we say the shares trade at a discount. Po important point to note though, it's not possible to arbitrage it within these situations because essentially we don't have access uh, to the investments within the fund. 
and another thing is uh, these um, share prices can actually stay at a discount for quite a long time. Now we'll look at some of the fees that are charged by the investment companies. So you can have your one-time fees or ongoing annual fees. You also have your load or also known as the sales commission and this could be a front-end load so this is paid when you buy the shares or a back-end load uh, which is paid uh, when you redeem the shares. Some uh, funds actually have both front-end loads and back-end loads but it depends on how each of the funds are structured. So if you're paying the fee up front i.e. your front uh, end load essentially it comes out of your investment. You need to be able to work out the numbers here so you're given the NAV and you know what percentage the load is you should be able to work out what the share price should be. And so it's a little counterintuitive because how this actually works is the load or the fee that you're paying in this case is based on the price you pay rather than on the NAV. Um, so most people would assume that uh, the, the fee you pay is as a percentage of the NAV but it actually doesn't work that way. Uh, so the way it works out is your NAV uh, equals the price that you pay multiplied by 1 minus the load. So that's the way it actually works. So we'll look at uh, the example here just to, to try and make some sense of it. Uh, so if NAV is $50 and there's a load of 6% on, on purchase, uh, the share would be sold for. And so what we do is we take the NAV and we just divide that by 1 minus the 6% load and we end up with a price that should be paid of $53.19. So let's start off with some easier numbers. So say we had, I'll just give you all the numbers here. So say we had a share price of 100, load 5%, and the NAV was $95. So working our way backwards, say we just knew what the NAV was, which was the 95, and load being the 5%, we say share price is this 95 divided by 1 minus 0.5, which gives us the $100. Uh, so intuitively what people might try to do might be to say share price should equal 95 multiplied by 1 plus 5 percent, which would give us $99.75, which would be wrong. Okay, so make sure you remember this. It's quite an easy formula, but one that could easily go wrong. And um, these, these kinds of questions come up quite frequently uh, in, the, in the exam. Key thing to note though, these loads or fees are essentially uh, a sales commission. So they're compensation for all of the marketing efforts and they are not acting as a p uh, performance incentive for your portfolio managers. Uh, so the annual fees, the, the ongoing annual fees uh, that the investors pay, they're the ones that cover any fund management fees, administrative fees and any uh, distribution fees on there. So that fund management fee, uh, that's essentially your incentive fee uh, for the fund manager. So these fees are also known as your 12B1 fees. So just in case you see that floating around, you know that those are your annual fees. So we've seen something like similar to this in equity. Uh, with your mutual funds, they can essentially be split. Investments with those uh, could follow a whole load of different strategies. Uh, so it could be based on style. Uh, so here we're saying the broad characteristics of the uh, investments within the fund are defining those. So it could be growth or value or large cap or mid cap, those sorts of things.